Hey, last, last weekend, I was speaking out in Ohio, so I got to go and visit Tony's church. And you guys, it was so cool. It was so cool because, uh, okay, they, they haven't actually started their services. They're supposed to start last weekend, but because of building permits, they have to wait till the first of the year. And uh, so they just got together, you know, themselves and had their own worship service, like 20 people from Cornerstone Church that are living in Ohio right now. And I tell you, it was so powerful being in this living room with them because they all knew why they were there. I mean, they didn't move to Ohio for fun, you know. Uh, you know, you, you don't do that. You, they, they moved to Ohio because they said, you know what, we're on a mission here. We want to, and, and it was really cool because uh, I, I surprised Tony and showed up at his work. He works at Pottery Barn Kids. And, uh, and I show up and he's got this red apron on that says, Santa's helper. <laughs> it looks so ridiculous. I wish I had a camera so I could show you guys. But, it, you know, the cool thing about it is because they're, they're all working, you know, the people that moved there from here at department stores or different things, they made sure they found jobs where they would interact with a lot of people. And the whole idea is when they get together, they would just pray for all the people they're working with and all their new neighbors and all the relationships. And I tell you, there's just something electric about being in a room full of 20 people that have just been transplanted from Simi Valley to Ohio that are all praying for each other, all know why they're there. They're on a mission. And, and it was, it, it's just exciting. It, it, and, and sometimes I think our greatest battle here in Simi Valley is to really believe that we're on a mission. You know, it's so easy to just let our, our roots sink in deep and think that we're here to, to make a home for ourselves and to play house. You know, versus saying, you know what, gosh, why am I in this city? I'm here to be a testimony. I'm here to stand up for the things of God. I'm here to love people. I'm on a mission. See, this, this can just feel like another weekend of church. We just show up, we go through the routine, and it can become heartless. We can kind of forget about the passion and what we should be fired up about. You see, when I read the life of Christ, I, I don't know what you get out of it, but I, I think when I, I used to read the Gospels, it was almost as though I, I pictured Jesus just going, and oh, a blind man, see. You know, and then, you know, a person who's, who's dead, okay, come out of the grave. And he just kind of went through the motions. But, but if you really study scriptures, you see that Jesus did not go through the motions. His heart, his passion was in so much of what he did. I mean, this, this, this passage we're, we're looking at today just shows how, how Jesus had so much emotion behind what he did. He had such a heart for people. He was consumed with that. And I think sometimes we can just do things out of routine and our hearts not really be in it. And, and that's a concern. Because that's not the way God wants us to live. Sometimes we're just numb. We don't get too fired up about anything. We don't get too sad about anything. We don't get too angry about anything. And yet, when you look at the life of Christ, you see, he, he was filled with passion. And his heart was in, into everything that he said and everything that he did. In fact, the passage we look at today in, in Luke chapter 19, it's, it's right after, okay, right after what we just last studied, where Jesus came through on the donkey and everyone was screaming, Hosanna, you know, the triumphal entry heading into Jerusalem. But, but you ever notice the verse that comes right after that? It's powerful. Verse, verse 41 of Luke 19, it says, As he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it. Okay, and that verb there, when it says that he wept, it literally means that he just kind of burst into tears. It was like a wailing. You ever notice that? That after everyone's, you know, screaming, Hosanna, blessed he comes in the name of the Lord, the next thing this, this, this gospel records is Jesus then looking at the city of Jerusalem and then just bawling his eyes out, bursting into tears, just weeping over this place. Why? It says in the very next verse, he, he says, if you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace, but now it's hidden from your eyes. See, Jesus comes and he sees the Jewish people. He sees Jerusalem. And you've got to understand something. God loves Jerusalem. Okay? I, I don't know how you can read the Bible and not get that. God absolutely loves, loves, loves the Jewish people. 
And so when, when Jesus sees Jerusalem and, and, and he's going in there knowing he's going to be crucified and knowing that all these people reject him, he doesn't get angry, which I think a lot of Christians get. He doesn't get frustrated. He just starts bawling his eyes out because he loves these people. And he, he says about the city, he goes, man, if you only knew why I was here. If you guys could only get it, understand, man, why I'm here for the city. It's for you. If you knew, I just want to bring you to peace with God. But you don't get it. You just don't get it. And he just starts crying. Have you ever pictured that scene in your mind? You ever pictured that scene of Jesus looking at the city of Jerusalem and then just bawling, wailing, because he loves them so much and they're not coming to him? Uh, when's the last time you felt anything like that? where someone's disbelief just brought you to tears. Not, not to anger, not to frustration, but just brought you to tears. Do you, do you care that much about people? Jesus just wept and wept and wept. And, and the phrase, he says, if only, if, you, if only you, if you'd known. It's very similar to what he says in the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, in Psalm 81, verse 13, it says, if my people would but listen to me. If Israel would follow my ways, how quickly would I subdue their enemies and turn my hand against their foes? He says, man, if you guys would just listen to me, man, I would, I would turn all your enemies away. I would just subdue them all. But you're, you're not listening. Again, in, in Isaiah chapter 48, verse 18, he says, if only you had paid attention to my commands, your peace would have been like a river, your righteousness like the waves of the sea. He just goes, gosh, if you would just pay attention to my commands, you, you'd be at total peace. Everything would be so good for you. Do you get that? And, and, and it's the same thing, you know, Matthew records that when, when Jesus saw, saw Jerusalem, that he says, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how, how I long to just gather you under my wings like a hen gathers her chicks, but you weren't willing. He goes, all I want to do was just keep you under my protection to be your king, to be your ruler, to be your father. He goes, but you keep running away. And so Jesus here in the ultimate act just starts bawling, going, man, you, you still won't come. Now, 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 don't get me wrong. God loves us all. Not just a little bit. He, he so loves the whole world. He loves all of us. But there is still some, you, you just see it in Scripture, there's a unique relationship with the Jewish people, the covenant people that he loved, that kept turning away from him keep rebelling. I mean, he's shown so much in the Old Testament. It's all about him loving his covenant people and, and, and how, you know, when, when the Egyptians enslaved them, what did he do? He says, I'll slay the firstborn of every Egyptian household because you don't enslave my people. You know, to let his people go when he goes, and I'm going to take you guys to a promised land, a, a land flowing with milk and honey. I'm going to take you to this place because you're my people. And yet they rebel against him. He goes, okay, i got to punish you now. You're going to wander around in the desert. But even in the desert, I love you, and I'm going to provide for you. Look, I'm going to give you food. I'm going to give you water. I'm going to bring you bread from heaven. I'm going to ha have me come to wh whatever you need. And then I'm going to take you to this promised land. They get to the promised land. They rebel against God again. Uh, there's sin. Other things started captivating him. He goes, i got to punish you again. I'm going to exile you. I'm going to take you out of your land because of your rebellion. But I'm going to protect you while you're in exile. And I'm going to bring you back. And he brings them back to their land and gives them prophets and tells them, look, God hasn't left you. He still loves you. He still wants you. He's restoring you. And then here is God's ultimate act of love for the Jews. He says, you know what? Even though you rebel against me again, I'm going to, I'm going to have my son. Okay, this is the ultimate, not just a prophet. I'm going to have my son come down. He's going to take the form of a baby. And as he grows up, becomes a man, he is going to be nailed on a cross. And he is going to pay for all of your crimes. Everything that, that you've done wrong, yes, it's absolutely wrong. It's absolutely sin. And you should pay. But I'm going to show you how much I love you. I'll have my son pay for you. And if you believe that, then you can be forgiven and you can spend eternity with me, which is what I've always wanted. And Jesus gets to this point, comes before Jerusalem, realizing everything that goes on, and he just starts bawling his eyes out. 
because he says, man, if you only got it, if you only understood what I was here to offer you, but you don't get it. You know, God did plenty, just as he's done in all of our lives. He's shown us plenty of things to show us that he's real. And yet there are people who will still say, I'm not going to follow him. And some of you in this room going, I'm not going to believe in God. I'm not going to believe in this Jesus, that he died for me. Okay, that's great that you guys want to believe that. That's your thing, and I'm glad that makes you feel better, but I'm not going to accept it. And, and, and there's always reasons. You know, people say, well, because, uh, you know, they just discovered a new dinosaur that uh, really is getting us to question, you know, how old the earth is. Others say, well, you know, it, it's, it's, it's because there's this island I know of where the people have never heard about Jesus. What about them? Or, you know what, I had some difficult things happen in my life. What, what about that? And what about my, my great-grandmother, who was just such an awesome lady? What, what about her? And, and there's question after question. And these are all valid questions, okay? These are totally valid questions. But the thing I found is whenever someone comes and talks to me about one of these things, and I answer the question, they come up with another one. And I'll talk through that, and there's another one, then another one. Then another one, and my question is, is this, is it really about these questions? Is that, is that really what keeps you from coming to the Lord? Or do you really just don't want to believe in a God? Are you like Israel, who it's not about God hasn't shown you that he's real, it's just you really don't want to be under God. You want to live life the way you want to live it. You think you've got a better way. You, you think that you can come to the end and, and think that you're a good person. You guys, if these are the issues, I mean, if there really are questions, please, please, come. Let's talk about them. That's what the staff's here to do. That's what the person sitting next to you is here to do. Talk through it. If it's about dinosaurs, hey, let's study dinosaurs. I'll get you a little study partner, and you guys can just study dinosaurs for weeks. If that's the issue, if that's the one thing that's keeping you, but if it's once that's over, then it's another one, another one, another one, and, and the truth is, is, is that really the issue? Because for Israel, it wasn't. It wasn't that they couldn't believe that there was a God. It was just that they couldn't get themselves to follow this God. They just couldn't see themselves really submitting themselves to anyone else's law. And, and there's nothing that Jesus can do at this point other than weep. And, um, and, and he says to them, look, if you only understood. See, God, God has so many good things in store for us. We, we don't even know it. Those of us who believe, you know, the Bible says that, that no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived what God has prepared for those who love him. It's like God's saying, those of you that love God in this room, you don't even have any idea what he has in store for you. Because your, your mind hasn't even conceived of it. And, and here's Jesus on the other side of that going, gosh, Jerusalem, I've got so much in store for you. I've got so many wonderful things for you. I'm even going to die for all of your crimes. I mean, everything's going to be wiped clean. Just come under my protection. And he sees it all. He knows it all. And they still won't follow. And he just bawls. Because if you could get it, if you could see it. And then, uh, and then he says, because they're not willing to follow, verse 43, the days will come upon you when your enemies... And remember those verses in the Old Testament. He says, if you would have obeyed my commands, your enemies, I would have subdued them. You know, I would have chased them away. But here he says, the days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment against you, encircle you, and hem you in on every side. They will dash you to the ground, you and the children within your walls. They will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. And again, I believe Jesus is saying this in all sadness over the city. He goes, gosh, because you guys aren't going to follow me, here's what's going to have to happen again. Okay, this time what's going to happen is your enemies are going to come, and he says that they're going to build an embankment. Embankment was like a wall. It was like this tossed up dirt. You're going to build an embankment around you and they're going to surround you. They're going to hem you in on every side. They're going to dash you to the ground. Not one stone's going to be left on top of another. What's amazing about Jesus' words is in A.D. 70, the Roman, the Roman army did come and invade Jerusalem. 
And under Titus, you know what they did? They built a wall around the city. The reason why they built a wall, in fact, they built a wall that was five miles long, the historian Josephus tells us. It was five miles long with 12 12 or 13 castles or, or guard towers. And they did all that in 10 days. Okay, they didn't need permits. They just, they just built this whole thing in 10 days. And, and, and the whole thing is, uh, the reason why they did it was, was to, to basically starve them to death. So the Jews could not escape Jerusalem and, and find any food. And so they, you know, just like the scripture said that they would hem them in, encircle them and hem them in. That's exactly what the Roman uh, army did. And then what's interesting, this whole thing about them uh, not leaving one stone on top of another and, and dashing it to pieces. A lot of you guys know, if you study history, you know that Jerusalem was burned down. You know, that the army came and they just burned them down. Now, now what happened in the burning is, uh, is this. When they burned down, let me just say something about cell phone. Um, the first ring is cool. I mean, the first person to have a cell phone go off, that's totally cool. What bugs me is the second guy. Because the first one should be a warning, right? Where you all go, ooh, that wasn't me. Okay, so whoever goes off the second time at any of the services, feel free to stare at them. Okay. Okay, the, the, the second prophecy, though. The whole, I mean, the first one, no big deal. That's cool. We all make mistakes. It's just, okay. The, uh, the second prophecy, okay. They burned down Jerusalem. Now, now, in the temple were all sorts of gold artifacts, right? And what happened to those artifacts? They all melted. They all melted into the stone. Do you know what Titus had the Roman army do? He had the Roman army, because all the gold was melted into the stone, he had them fill their chariots with rocks to weigh them down, and then he had them just run over the city over and over and over again to sift everything to, to rubble and powder so they could sift through it and get the gold out. And, and you read that in history and you go, wow, that's a pretty dramatic way that God's prophecy was fulfilled. That the embankment was built and the, the, the place was raised to the ground, leveled to the ground, and even sifted into powder because Jesus says that's what's going to happen. And, and it was all because they refused to believe. And while that's sad, I go, well, it was just a city. It was just a bunch of buildings. Yeah, it was sad, but it's just a location. What's sadder is that God isn't bluffing when he says there's going to be a judgment. When he says, look, you reject my forgiveness, there's going to be a judgment. What, what, what's sad to me is some of you are going to come before God and because you haven't accepted the forgiveness that Jesus offers on that cross, and you in your mind, you think, no, I don't need it. I've lived a good life. That's so sad to me. Because you're going to come before God and say, God, I haven't done anything worthy of judgment. I haven't done anything worthy of punishment. And then you know what he's going to do? God's going to go through your life. Go, okay, let's go through your life. Let's see, have you broken any of my commands? Let's just go from the moment you could speak. Let's look at your words. Let's just go day by day by day and look at your life and see if you've ever broken any of my commands. And I think you're going to be blown away. You guys... I've tried to live a good life. I couldn't do it. Man, I know I've sinned against God. See, but I can come to the end of my life and say, God, I know I deserve your punishment, but, what, but I believe that you love me in spite of that, and you sent your son, and he paid for it. He paid for it on the cross, and I totally accepted it, and, and I'm so thankful that he already paid for it, and I'm not going to spend eternity paying for my crimes. And the sad thing is that some of you will. Because you're going to sit here today and go, no, I, I lived a good life. And you're going to see, God's going to expose all of our motives, all of our deeds, and say, no, you're, 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 not, you're not better. You're not good. See, the only reason why we think we're good is we, we compare ourselves to people that, that have done things worse than we have. And we go, okay, that's bad, you know, but not me. No, if you really looked at yourself in light of God's law and looked at his commands and looked at your own life, you'd go, no, I'm guilty. And what's sad to me is that all God wants to do is give you life. 
All God wants to do is just forgive you of all that crap and all the stupid things you did in life. All the times you hurt other people, all the time. That's all he wants for you. All he wants to do is spend eternity with you and give you these commands that lead you to life. Man, and honestly, there's just times where I just want to bawl my eyes out because I just think, you, you still don't get it? God's not trying to destroy your life. He's not trying to put you under all these restrictions that are going to take all the fun out of life. I mean, from cover to cover, this is a love story of your creator saying, man, what more can I do for you? And yet you still want to go off on your own way? You guys, God loves you. God loves you so much, despite what you've done despite what your life looks like, despite your own arrogance, your own rejecting of him, he loves you. That's what this book is about. And all he wants to do is just kind of gather you under his protection, teach you a way to live that's going to blow away any other way, and have you spend eternity with rewards that no eye has seen, no ear has, has heard, no mind has conceived of. He just wants to bless you like crazy. And yet... Like these people, you just go, I'm not willing, and it's just so, so sad. But I don't want you to think that God is just some machine up there that stamps you guilty or not guilty and then just feels nothing for you. But it breaks his heart more than it does mine. You know, I, that, that's the thing that I, I think I, I looked at this week, that I thought of this week, is, gosh, as much as I hurt for people that turn away from God, that it hurts God even more. And... Uh, we have a very passionate God. Where do you think we get all of our emotions from? It's from this God. And we've been created in his image. And, and you see his passion in a different way in the next verse. Because, okay, the, the, you see the... It's crazy when you read this passage because one moment he's, he's, he's you know, experiencing the triumphal entry where everyone's worshiping him. Then he stands before a city and bawls his eyes out. Then, in the next verse, he comes to the temple. In verse 45, he says, Then he enters the temple, and he begins driving out all the people that were selling things in front of the temple. And, and he says, It's written, he said, Then my house will be a house of prayer, but you've made it a den of robbers. And every day he was teaching at the temple, but the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the leaders among the people were trying to kill him, yet they could not find any way to do it because all the people hung on his words. So he goes from crying over the city to, to getting to the temple, and he sees that people are selling things in front of the temple. And so he starts driving them out. And, and mind you, he'd already done this a few years before, probably about three years beforehand. We, we read in, in John chapter 2, in the beginning of his ministry, that he came with, with a whip, and he just starts driving these people out of the temple. And here it is three years later, because we naturally all we gravitate back to our sin, right? He gets there, and he sees the same thing going on, and he starts driving these people out. Now, what were they doing, this whole idea of selling? There's a lot written about this, about how uh, some of the religious leaders would actually sell animals for sacrifice. Because the Old Testament taught that you needed an unblemished animal, you know, and, and so people would come and they're going to sacrifice an animal. The priest would look over the animal and go, eh, that's not good enough, but you can buy one of ours. And they would sell it at a, at a ridiculous price. And these things are going on. Jesus sees it, he drives them out, and then he starts teaching at the temple. It sounds harsh, doesn't it? I mean, especially that scene where he's, he's coming through with whips and just getting these people away from the temple. And he says, look, this isn't going to happen. Not, not, not at my temple. This is supposed to be a house of prayer. Not a place where you come and you rip people off. And he drives out that which was evil. And while it seems harsh, you've got to understand, this was a total act of love. I mean, even this, even the things that God does that sometimes we go, gosh, that seems cruel. That seems harsh. Even that's an act of love. Because what did Jesus do once he got those people out of there? He starts teaching at the temple. In fact, Matthew says that uh, then the lame, the crippled, the blind, they started coming to the temple and Jesus healed them. And so this very place where people were ripping each other off suddenly became what it was supposed to be, a place where the good news was preached, a place where, where those who were hurting could come and find healing through Jesus. And the only way he could do that is if he drove out 
that which was evil. You see, you guys, the best thing we could do as a church here is to drive out anything that is false, anything that's impure, anything that's not of God. Because Jesus says that this was supposed to be a house of prayer. Now, what is prayer? Prayer is when you talk to God. You interact with the living God. That's prayer. And he says that's what this temple is supposed to be, a place where you interact with the living God. And the best thing we can do is is drive out anything that would make this seem like a show or something for you to sit back and watch or whatever else and make this a place where you interact with the living God, an actual house of prayer. You see, the reason why this is so important is because If this is a place where you just interact with me and you go, oh, I go there to hear a sermon from Francis and we interact, because that's not nearly as powerful as a place where you interact with God. You see, because when you interact with God, you can't lie. When you interact with me, you can totally lie. And I'm stupid enough to believe you. Seriously. I mean, every single person in this room has the ability to lie and get me to believe it. And that's why it's pointless to have a place where you interact with people. When you interact with God, what are you going to lie about? See, if you come and you interact with me, you can make excuses for all the sin in your life, and I'll go, wow, I'll even feel sorry for you. I'll go, oh yeah, I I guess I would have done the same thing too. But you interact with God, and God says, look, you have no excuse for your sin. God can say that. Because he says, look, I promised that I would never allow you to be tempted beyond what you can handle. And I know your life. I know everything I've done. Yeah, I know that there were times when it was hard, but I never allowed you to be tempted beyond what you could handle. Every time there was a temptation, I always gave you a way of escape. Remember that time? Remember how you could have gotten out? But you chose not to because you wanted your sin. And God can say to you, look, there's, there's, no, there's no excuse for your sin. Because he knows your life. For me, I go, well, I don't know, that sounds pretty tough. I'm sorry, I'll cry for you, you know. Uh, forget about it. And God says, look, I gave you the power to put to death those deeds. See, this is, this is supposed to be a room where you interact with God. And you come before God and say, okay, God, drive out anything in me that's not right. Because I'm passionate about that. That's one of the things that I'm passionate about, just like you. You see, just like Jesus cleansed out the temple, what does the Bible say? Where does the Bible say the temple is today? It's us. 1 Corinthians teaches that we're the temple of the Holy Spirit. And so God's desire, His Holy Spirit's desire, is to come before, come into us and say, let me just drive out those things that are impure and replace them with something so much better. That's all He wants. You guys, it's not a bad thing. It's painful at times. It's difficult at times. But only if we want to hold on to that sin. You guys, I, I want to... I want to give you some time right now to interact with God. I want you to forget that I'm I'm here, that anyone else is here, and I want this place just to be a house of prayer where you come before God, where you can't lie or make excuses before God, the God that loves you, knows your life. And and so why don't we do this? Would you just close your eyes and just bow your heads? Okay, so so no one else distracts you. And we're just going to make this a house of prayer right now. Where you interact with the living God. And, And would you just ask Him right now just to drive out anything in your life that is impure or false and to cleanse you out like He did the temple. And if you need prayer, if you want to get baptized or anything else, I'll be up here by the prayer room. But right now, let's just have a few minutes of silence where you just interact with God himself.